So I like, I don't know why you would ever use that form of analysis. Uh, so you understand? Well, why don't you explain to me what there? what is what? Why is it that you think it's so surprising? Because I guess I don't understand what the incredulity is about. I mean, like, it seems like there are a couple of issues in terms of, like, rationalizing it or making it work. There are a couple of assumptions, so related to, like, the transformation problem. Um, and I, it just it feels like modern economic theory can explain everything pretty adequately. I, I, don't, I just I don't know why we would use, like, the labor theory of value to explain anything ever. I just... Well, what is it that you think modern economic theory explains <clears throat> that the labor theory of value... I'm sorry, I guess, what is it that you think the labor theory of value explains that the modern, modern economic theory explains better? Uh, the relationship between the, like, productions of commodities, the relationship between, like, capital labor and the production of commodities? I guess I don't understand. So, like, what, what, yeah, why, exact, how, what wh exactly is the datum that the labor theory of value is seeking to explain? That. Isn't the labor theory of value just supposed to relate like the like uh, like labor and capital and commodities produced? Isn't it just supposed to be a way to like relate all of these things and to find them in common terms? I I don't think so. Okay, tell me what you think it is, or what is it for you? It's an attempt to theorize the dynamics of uh, the capitalist mode of production. Wait, can you tell me what the difference is between what you just said and what I said? I didn't understand what you said. Okay, can you explain what that means, what you just said? So, the idea is we want to understand what it is that, um, how it is that a capitalist economy will develop over time and understand what explains those dynamics, right? That's what the aim of the theory is, right? To attempt to determine the evolution of the capitalist mode of production, right? What, how a capitalist economy will evolve over time, right? Um, okay, I, you know, I guess I didn't get that far in my understanding of it. I thought that the labor theory of value was just like a, an incredibly like relational thing that is able to let you determine the value of like commodities based on like the uh, input. For well, it, do it does attempt to determine value, but value on the labor theory of value is a technical term. Well, every and term and anything is a technical term. What do you mean? Of course. What I mean is, is that it doesn't mean the same thing as it does in other economic theories or even well, course, in ordinary parlance. Sure, of course. Yeah, and see, so I think that raises an issue about how it is that modern economic theories, to use your term, um, is able to do what the labor theory of value does better. Well, right? but what is the point? I, yeah, I guess, but like, so my biggest problem with the labor theory of value is, um, I, like, I don't know what value means. And I think that the definition of it is incredibly murky and, like, very circular. Well, I can try. Well, wait a minute. Okay, sure. so I'm not. I'm not sure why you would say that it's circular. Okay. Can you tell me, um, well, I'll just ask a few questions then, and you can try to explain it to me. All right. So can you tell me how to figure out the value of a good or service using the labor theory of value, the value of a commodity? Are you asking what, on the theory, the value is understood to be? The yep. value of a commodity is understood to be? Mm hmm So value on the labor theory of value mm -hmm. is... Um, it's what's called a theoretical unobservable, right? Do you understand mm -hmm. what a theoretical unobservable is? I can guess by what theoretical and unobservable mean. But, well, I but just mean ahead. that's a technical term in philosophy of science, right? It's something that's posited that isn't directly observed, right? But that's posited to explain some phenomena. Okay. Right? It's kind of like an electron or something like that, right? Like, you don't see an electron, right? But you posit them in a theory in order to I don't know if I would compare an, an electron that's like a testable thing to, like, just something that we arrive at via pure reason, right? I think that these are two fundamentally well, different What things. makes you think that value is not testable? Because it's a, because 
whatever value is going to be here is probably something that you're going to arrive at through a set of axioms that doesn't necessarily have to map onto a real world. It doesn't have to be like an observable thing. I think it's different than something you test well, for. The, like the point, point of the theory, right, is to actually explain observations, right? It's actually meant to predict uh, phenomena. So I don't see why it would be any different from an electron. Okay, sure. So I guess like my, my question there then, so I, we didn't really define value at all. I understand, but, or maybe we can go back to that, but I, I, well, cause once we get through your, your set of definitions, my question is going to be is what does the labor theory value predict that I can't under current economic models? Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of predictions. Um, so we can go, we can talk about those. So yeah, can you just give me like one prediction? I'm just curious. Like, what is something that like, oh, I have like this economic question and the labor theory value gives me a really clear answer and I can't understand this using like contemporary economics. It's not a question of not being able to understand things, right? What the theory attempts to do is determine the laws of motion of the capitalist mode of production, right? So the idea is this is what, we should, this is how we should expect to see a capitalist economy unfold over time. Right. Yeah, so like, so what is like, so on that line of thought, we should be able to get like, what is like a prediction that- Yeah, the there's, there's, like, there's yeah. probably about close to a dozen of them. Yeah, can I just want one? I'm just curious, like one. Yeah, so one would be that um, workers re will receive in the long run a declining share of the total value product. Can you explain why? Well, to explain why, we'd have to talk a lot about the labor theory of value, what the labor theory of value is, right? So if you want a lesson on the labor theory of value, that's fine. We can have a little seminar on it. But it's not gonna, there's not going to be like some simple answer that you're going to understand unless you're acquainted with the details of the theory. Okay, so I I think you have a severe problem with whatever framework you're using if you can't like explain something and make somebody understand it. Like if it has to I be didn't say I couldn't I didn't say I couldn't explain it and I didn't say that you couldn't understand it. I said it wouldn't be a simple matter to do so and it wouldn't is just there a take way a that you can minutes. summarize and it this is like a 30 minute lesson to make me understand this. I can try to take you through 30 minutes uh, of introduc introductory material on the labor theory of value and see if we can get there. But I can't promise that in 30 minutes you'll understand why the theory predicts that there should be a declining um, share of the total value product accruing to workers as a secular tendency. And you can't explain that in any kind of common parlance. You can only explain that through your framework. There's no way that you can... I don't know what you mean by explain it in a common parlance, right? I can so tell you When I say common parlance, what I mean is using words that most people could understand. You can give like a general explanation of like, oh, well, this thing will probably happen because of like these forces. You can't yeah. do that outside so, of... You speaking. know, there's... I don't, I don't really understand... Like, you think... Do you think like that if I was giving uh, an explanation in terms of marginal utility theory that would involve common parlance yeah of course easily for sure yes i don't think so if i say to you marginal product of capital do you know what that means um does this have to do with like the production um the uh the marginal production uh fucking formula or whatever basically the idea of that like um fuck i forgot what this means but yes, you can explain yeah, it's it. That's not common I, parlance, right? Yeah, no, That's no, no. a technical I, term. No, no, no. But I can look right? this up and I can explain it to you in like two yeah, seconds. Yeah, well, you can, look up, you can look up any term that I use in the labor theory of value and discover its meaning, just like you can in mainstream economic theories, right? Mm -hmm. These are scientific theories. And so they're going to employ specialized vocabulary. So I just don't understand what the objection is. Okay. So the marginal product of capital means that it's the extra bit that you can make every time you add a little bit more capital, right? That would be like a common parlance explanation of like what the marginal product of capital is, right? So if you add like another oven to a fast food restaurant, the more burgers that you can make as a result of doing that or whatever, there's going to be like a marginal 
addition to where you can only add so many more ovens and get so many more burgers out. I feel like it's like a relatively simple thing to understand. I don't need to talk for 45 minutes to explain that to somebody. Look, I don't understand, right? You don't actually know, you don't actually know what labor theory of value is, right? You're not actually, if I asked you, tell me what labor theory of value is, could you tell me? Uh, I'd have to go look it up again, but I thought it was basically like capital plus like socially necessary labor equals like uh, whatever commodity you produce or whatever, something no. like that. Well, that's not it, but yeah, I mean, it's not totally, you're not like, you know, it seems like you're sort of like badly reproducing some, hey, something I don't know if you've understood this or not, but you've said absolutely nothing of substance in the past like 15 minutes. Like all you've said over and over again is it's complicated. I can't explain like. I, I feel like this is. I think we need to get clear. Yeah, so we need to get yeah. clear on something, right? Go you for don't actually you don't actually know what the theory is, right? You just okay. have some vague idea about it, right? Sure. Okay, so you're not real. Now, so what I'm trying to understand is how uh -huh. are you in a position to evaluate the theory if you don't even know what the theory is, right? Because I've read other people's evaluations on it, and it seems like horseshit. Nobody, cont like, nobody contemporaneously fine. uses, fine like, if it labor seems, theory value. I, don't, look, I know that there are big care. problems associated with it, so why would I spend yeah, all of my care. time reading about, I'm like, not, oh, look, well, this is exactly what the labor theory value is when nobody uses it in modern day. Like, there's a million other things that I would study that would be more relevant to fine. understanding economics today than it's the labor theory It's fine if you don't, it's fine if you don't understand it, right? Now, if you think that that entitles you to attack it, I don't. I'm going to want to hear not, not, I don't. I don't. I don't. Att I don't sit here and say like, oh, by the way, like, I, here is my destiny's debunking of the labor theory of value. The problem is that every time I talk to somebody that purports to be a huge supporter of the labor theory of value, whenever I ask them really basic questions like, oh, well, like, what's a prediction that the LVT can make that I can't make under like marginalism or marginal utility or whatever? Instead, I get somebody that will babble for twenty well, I minutes, gave you saying a like. You, Sure, I and then you, you, you did you right? you you, and then you asked, no 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 no. So you, you ran, what you did theory. was you rambled off a sentence, and then you said you can't explain why. I didn't. Not ramble. spending. You did. You you rambled no. off something. You said you can't explain why without tech going into an hour of discussion. Yeah. So you you seem to think that a scientific theory, right? It's, it's somehow not a required. What do you mean by a scientific theory? You don't know what a science is. Is the philosophy of the labor theory of value a scientific theory now? Or labor I mean, theory I... of value is a scientific theory, <sighs> okay. right? Is that what you're contesting, that it's not I don't science? Know. How do you, can you tell me how you test the labor theory of value? What is like an experiment? Yeah, what you do on? is you figure out what predictions are derivable from the theory, mm -hmm. right? And then you look and see whether those predictions have come true. How do you get, how do you even make predictions though, when some of your inputs are these like vacuous things like socially necessary labor? Wait, why do you say that that's vacuous? How do you measure it? If you can't tell me how you measure it, by the way, it's vacuous. So this is a pretty important answer and it's going to need to be more than it's going to take me an hour to explain. How do you measure so, like what socially necessary labor is? The average quantity of unskilled labor time that it takes to reproduce a commodity. So how do you explain the fact that value seems so inadequately mapped onto price that there's such huge differences that we would expect to see like it's not similar... a theory of prices sure but if value doesn't map onto price ever what the fuck is value why do we care about that variable what does value right. mean to us? so the reason why we care about that variable is because what we observe when we look at commodity prices over time is that there's uh, a long-run equilibrium price Right. And so values are actually posited to explain those prices. So a value is supposed to explain the long-term equilibrium price, as in like the final price that a good or service will meet when, when, what, when what equilibrium is reached? So do you, do you know what an, a long-run equilibrium price is? Uh, no, ex go ahead and explain it to me, okay? So like if... We take a given commodity, say a, uh, a loaf of bread or an airplane or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. we, can look at, we can look at the market price over time, right? And what we'll observe is that supply and demand fluctuations will cause market prices to oscillate around a basic axis, right? 
which is the equilibrium price or long run. How can you say that there's like a long run equilibrium price on any given commodity, though, when like demand for certain things changes all the time or even like supplies for things can change over time? Well, the point is, that's something that what we what the basic idea is going to be that although the prices of bread and airplanes vary depending on um, supply and demand fluctuations, it's going to be the case that in the long run, the cost of an airplane is going to be many thousands of times more than that of a loaf of bread. Right? We don't know that. That's not necessarily true. I didn't say it was necessarily true, right? That's what's been observed, right? Which is how the labor theory of value got formulated in the first place. Because the idea was that it, people were became aware of this phenomenon that um, there were long-run average prices. How are, there the long idea, run, how are there long-run average prices when there are new goods and services that are springing up all the time? I don't understand what that means, especially when you talk about why something Why would like, there be an inconsistency between those two things? I, I just don't know like a particular good or service that is going to have anything that I would be comfortable calling a long-run equilibrium. Like, What's the long-run equilibrium on like a Nintendo 64 or the long-run equilibrium on like a calculator from you know the year 1940 like, like i'm not really sure i understand what you're contesting right do you think it's not the case that um okay hold on i'm gonna rephrase this and if you can't understand this then we can talk again later because th these questions are incredibly simple so i don't know if you're being evasive or if you're just pretending to not understand what I'm asking. So it sounds to me that what you're saying is that we should see some long-term equilibrium, some settling of price that happens with any given good or service. What I'm telling you is that it feels to me, I'm sorry, let me phrase this a little strong. What I'm telling you is that there are different types of goods and services that appear over time. The demand for these can dramatically change in, from one point in history to another, such that I don't know if a price will necessarily settle on some equilibrium. So for instance, you gave the example earlier, well, a plane might always cost more than a loaf of bread, but Theoretically, there could be a future where climate change dramatically curbs our ability to farm and all of a sudden bread will become far, far, far more valuable than, than a plane, even when it comes to producing it. So I don't understand how you can so confidently say that we will observe these equilibrium prices when there are new goods and services that appear all the time. Yeah. So what I said is, is that they have been observed, right? But they haven't been observed. I'm telling you they haven't. So the, 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 there is no equilibrium price today, unless you're saying the equilibrium price of everything goes to zero as the demand for it disappears, except for some like essential goods or services. Like cotton looms probably aren't as in demand, you know, in Marxist or today as they were in Marxist time, as we've gotten better capital to, to weave fabrics. Yeah, so I'm not claiming, right, that all goods remain in production, right, for all time, right? I'm saying that when they're in production, right, over the term of their history of being in production, right, what's been observed is, well, at least what's believed to have been observed, right, is that there are these long-run average prices, so-called equilibrium prices, right? Why, why would and, we observe and these so prices? Given, Sorry, given, that, given that economists have observed those things, right, or believed to observe those things, right, they think they're seeing an equilibrium price, right. What they tried to do then was try to figure out what determines the equilibrium price, right. And the reasoning was that given that supply and demand cancel each other out at equilibrium, right, it's not actually going to be um, supply and demand that do the explaining. Right. Something else has to explain it. Wait, why is that? Can you explain that? Why is that? What do you mean by it cancels out? So if supply is equal to demand, that's the point of equilibrium, right? Okay. So we understand that supply increases in supply uh, at the same schedule of demand are going to cause the price to fall below the equilibrium. Similarly, increases of demand mm -hmm. at the same supply are going to cause the price to rise above equilibrium. Sure. Right? So we understand that supply and demand mm -hmm. um, will determine the deviation of the market price from 
the equilibrium price, right? Okay. The point is, though, when supply is equal to demand, that doesn't tell us why supply equals demand at that point rather than at some other point, right? Well, isn't it just because there's a certain quantity demanded at a certain price? Isn't that all that means? Well, question is, why is it that... Um, why is it that in the long run we have this basic stability? Because there's a scarcity of resources. People only have so much money that they can spend on so many products, and it's up to them to figure out the utility of any given product and how much they're willing to spend on it? Well, I don't know whether that's a good answer or not, right? You'd have to show me how you can actually provide some kind of like mathemat mathematizable model I'm sure if you talk to somebody in econometrics that there's like a billion different models where people try to figure out like how much money people would be willing to spend that, on. That may be the case, right? What I'm saying is, is that the, the theorists of the labor theory of value came up with their own theory, right, of equilibrium prices, right? And their theory was that what determined the equilibrium price was quantities of labor, right? Now, that idea was refined over time. It became quantities of labor to average quantities of unskilled labor time with some further conditions, right? Now, the interesting thing about that is, is that when you actually have that um, account in place, that theoretical account in place, you can then generate other predictions um, of the long run dynamics of capitalist economies and that's how it is that we can find confirmation and discon or possible disconfirmation of the theory like in any other scientific theory right i guess i just i don't know how you figure out like how have you when do you decide in your theory when you've reached like equilibrium pricing when the value and the price match like how do you ever make that declaration how do you know I don't think you need to know that. So then what does value represent? So, again, value is understood to be an average quantity of unskilled labor time that it takes to reproduce a good at a given time or place, right? That's what's understood to determine value. Yeah, I just, I've never understood how you, like, that unskilled labor time, like, there are multiple things that we could create using unskilled labor time. It feels like your prediction would say that all of these things would roughly have the same value, but the prices would like fluctuate wildly in the market. Well, what, what, what prediction? I, I don't understand. What prediction are you talking about? If, if you're saying that you can take the quantity of labor that goes into a given commodity, then you should be able to determine the value of that commodity. No? Or am I misunderstanding you still? Yeah. Yeah, what I'm saying is that... Wait, wait, did, wait, did I misunderstand you or did what I said make sense? Uh, you'll have to repeat it. Okay, let me say this one more time. So it, it feels like what you're telling me is that if I give you the quantity of socially necessary labor that goes into creating a certain thing, that you should be able to know the value of it, deductively so. Is that true or not? Yeah, that's the, the average quantity okay. of unskilled labor time okay. that so it my takes to produce is, a good is yeah, the my, value. My, yeah, so my question is, is it feels like I can take different commodities that I could produce with the same amount of socially necessary labor, and I would get wildly different prices for those things in the market based on their like demand. But I don't know if you account for demand in... in yeah, the theory labor. is not a theory of prices, so you could get different... You could get prices that are markedly at variance with value. So then how do you ever figure out when the price is where the value is? If you're telling me that, like, well, the value is going to be what the price in the long-term equilibrium will You, you don't need to figure that out. So then what is value again? I'm sorry, can you explain one more time for me? Yeah, so value is a theoretical unobservable that's postulated to explain equilibrium prices. It's understood that it will coincide with equilibrium prices under certain conditions. And in the conditions where it doesn't coincide with equilibrium prices, mm -hmm. those, um, that variance is something that can be understood as a systematic deviation 
from the value, right? And then how do you determine, like, when it comes to, like, what, what, is, what units do we express a value in? Is it arbitrary? You can express it in hours. Okay, and then how do you make the calculation of, like, how much, like, socially necessary labor goes into producing a given commodity? You're asking how do we know in, a, in the case of a given commodity? Sure. How much socially necessary labor time was expended? Mm -hmm. You'd have to be able to open the books of all the different firms to know that. Does it take into account things like education or productivity, like access to capital or? Um, I'm not sure what you what you what you mean by take into account education. What do you okay, I mean what education? What do you what do you what do you what do you, what do you what do you think I mean by that? I, I don't know why you're asking me that question. Okay, so clearly there's probably if I were to try to wire a house to an electrical grid, or if I were to try to wire a house as electrical shit up, it would take me a lot longer than an electrician, right? So it seems like that education is probably somewhat relevant to figuring out like that socially necessary labor number, right? No, am I wrong? Or so you're talking about how degrees of skill can be understood as varying uh, in some way that's correlated with degrees of education. Yes, that, and then the access to capital as well. So, for instance, yeah, but, a really good. But I don't, I'm not yeah. seeing why the education has to be appealed to if what we're concerned with is the average degree of skill when it comes to a certain well because the average degree of labor. skill might be far different from one worker to the next right so if yeah you so we're it, talking about an average okay but i i don't know if an average it, the average seems quite meaningless here i guess so there's an average quantity of labor time that uh -huh. it takes to produce a certain good does that seem meaningless yes why does it seem meaningless that there's an average quantity of labor time that it takes to produce a certain good? I don't get it. Because if we're given a set of data and we've got values that kind of gather around two different points, a high and a low point, an average here is literally worthless, right? We wouldn't take an average here because it, wouldn't, it would be misleading in terms of the data. So I, we I don't get it. So you've got a, wait, you've got on, a number. I'll explain to you how it's wait, supposed wait, let me, to let me, work. Let me, let me just explain what I just said. I, you keep saying I don't get it. Like, I don't, I don't understand what world you exist in, okay? So what I'm telling you is that if I give you a set of data, okay, and that set has five ones and five tens, and you say, oh, well, the average is like 5.5, .5, so that's a good representation of that data. We both know, or I hope you know, that's not a good representation of that data. The average there is misleading. That's what I, I'm saying. I don't, I don't know what the norm is that you're appealing to, but I'll just explain. Hold on, wait, wait. Do you need to, me to explain what I just said about like an why it's, average? It's is not average. really relevant. Right. I'll just tell you what it is since you're claiming not to understand it. Right. So let's say, um, let's say there's a specific good, right? Let's say it's a chair, right? Let's say there are a hundred different firms that produce that chair, right? There's going to be varying amounts of labor time expended across the different firms producing those chairs, right? Some firms can produce 100 chairs in 10 hours. Others will produce 100 chairs in 20 hours, right? You just add up the total number of labor hours and the total number of chairs, right? And you're going to get, you're going to be able to divide by the number of chairs, right? And you're going to be able I, to get... I understand you can do that. I don't know why it took you... I understand you can do this, but this is such a wholly worthless number. Like, what... Like, what why is it worthless? Because... Do, do you want to... I mean, like, we can go over the difference of, like, median, mode, average, range. Like, like if we want to do, like, really basic sets of numbers and, and how we look at them, I, I don't know how far back I need to go to talk about, like, I'm just why trying it, to understand why it's worthless, right? I'm it's just worthless telling you because that's what social, means. Because if somebody just tells me... You, I'm just I understand. Minute, I know just what you're saying. I'm just telling you that's what the value is on the theory, right? Sure, and I'm just... Now, when you say it's not, worthless, right... Presumably, that's worthless res with respect to some aim, right? So what aim is it that the theory is attempting to target, right, that that is worthless 
with worthless with I just, respect I guess, to. I don't understand what socially necessary labor means, I guess. I don't know what that value means or why we care about it, other than the fact that... I just that told it, you what it meant, right? It means average quantity of unskilled labor time that it takes to reproduce a good at a given time or place. And that average right? quantity could be an average of ones and one hundreds, and it might average out to 50. But that's I, I don't see what difference any of that makes, I right? I'm just telling you, I'm point? just telling you, that's how what is understood to be what determines value sure. on the theory, right? Sure. Now, what's the objection? I, I, I just, I don't understand the utility of it. I don't understand the utility so, of it. So you don't have an objection, right? You're just saying you don't understand the theory, which is fine, right? If you don't understand the theory, that's perfectly fine, right? Then you just say, I don't understand the theory, right? But that's not what you do, right? You say the theory is bunk, it's worthless, it doesn't make any sense, right? Why not it, just it say, I don't it understand? Might make, it might just, make perfect sense. Just a sense. second. The theory, just a the second. Might make just a second. Sense. Please, wait, please wait till I'm finished. I'm not saying that your theory doesn't please make sense. Please wait till I'm finished talking. I'm not saying that your theory doesn't okay. make okay. sense. It might okay, make great. perfect sense. Okay? Great. All I'm so saying is, I don't know don't what the utility have, of the theory is. That's have, it. I told you what the utility of the theory is, right? The utility is that it's a variable that only that theory talks about. Who cares? What difference? You don't think that... Uh, it's Did I care about the Marxian definition of value? No, I don't care about that. Who care? No one cares about that. You yourself have said multiple times. So the now theory, doesn't necessarily map onto price. If the so who theory cares? predicts that there are going to be economic crises, right? Or if the theory predicts that capitalism can't evolve indef indefinitely into the future without breaking down. I right? think it might. Who knows? Maybe it will. Yeah, but that would be something that people would care about, right? It, you know, it could be, but Marx himself yeah. thought that the, the capitalist system would break down in his lifetime. So, sorry. And, and, and now we hear that it's going to break down 100 years from now. Just so a like, minute. Just uh -huh. a minute. Just a minute. I'm just addressing the point where you said, okay. who cares, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a reason to care that people might have, right? No, not for something that is equivalent to Nostradamus predicts economics. No. Sorry, like, you haven't established that. I don't have to establish that. No you, one uses you, this theory your, anymore. And your, it predicted the downfall yeah. of capitalism I, for over I, 100 I, years. Well, first and it of all, it's, I'm first sorry. Of all, sorry. I, no, of all, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. Okay? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, look. I'm not interested in the smart-ass comments, yeah. right? Okay. Is, is your view that the theory is bunk or not? My view is that I have never in my life been given a problem, and I thought, man... I don't understand this problem at all. And then somebody is like, oh, well, if we analyze this from an LTV perspective, now we have way more, like we've got a better tool to make sense of this problem. And then it's like, oh shit, I, you know what? Yeah, totally. I didn't understand and now I do. Now this so, is helpful. So, so this, this gets clear on this. You mm -hmm. don't. You said you don't and then it. You don't claim that the theory is false. Is that right? The theory, I don't, I, what does it mean to be false? I mean, as long as it, it adheres to all of its definitions, it could be internally consistent. I didn't well, ask you if it was internally consistent. That's a different claim, right? The theory makes predictions about how capitalist societies should evolve. Can you right? walk me through like one clear... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Speaking okay. vague, okay. general. Wait a all minute, right. wait a minute. Uh, I just want to get clear on this, right? Your claim is not that the theory is false, is that right? Well, it depends on what you mean by false. Is it internally consistent or does it make accurate predictions? I didn't ask you if it was internally consistent. Do you think the well, theory is not internally me. consistent? I'm, it, I would hope it is. So you don't, you don't think the theory is internally inconsistent, right? I don't know the LTV enough thoroughly to right. know whether or not it's you internally You don't know consistent. it well enough to know if it's internally consistent. Do you Correct. know it well enough to know whether it's false or not? I, I don't... It depends on what you mean by false. I, so you understand, right, that there are propositions that what what predictions are, are propositions right we should expect to see x right over time mm -hmm. right so so let's say um a rising rate of exploitation right we should expect to see a rising rate of exploitation over time right that's a prediction of the theory right why would the theory predict that can you walk me through that Again, I can walk you through it if you want to take the time and have a seminar on the LTV. Can you explain right? it to me in less than like three minutes? No, I can't. 
Okay. I mean, not in a way that you not go ahead. Not in a way that you would understand. Then just start talking. Then do it in five or ten minutes or twenty minutes or go explain it. Why? So you want to have a seminar on the labor theory of value right now? Yeah, I want you to tell me why we would expect to see less and less uh, or more exploitation of workers. All right. So let's start with the basic formula Mm -hmm. for capital. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for value. Okay. Right. The formula for value, the value of a commodity, mm-hmm. is C plus V plus S, right? Okay. C is constant capital. Mm-hmm. Constant capital refers to um, what are sometimes called capital goods in mainstream economic theories. So it's going to be basically the goods. Um, the material goods that go into production that are not actually labor, right? So it's going to be... Um, like natural resources, right? It's going to be labor. I'm sorry. It's going to be machinery, okay. um, tools. Um, well, hold on. Does, I thought that those things count as having had labor enacted on them prior to this. So yeah, for instance, the value, you, the value yeah. of capital goods mm-hmm. is going to be broken down into further components of C, V, and S, V being labor inputs. Okay. And if you keep breaking down the C, right, eventually all you're going to have are labor inputs. Gotcha. The idea is that all um, capital in- inputs can be broken down into labor inputs. Okay. So, um, so C is going to refer to buildings, machinery, raw materials, energy inputs, um, and other types of auxiliary products that are necessary in the production process, things like soap or lubricants and so on, right? Now, then there are labor inputs. Mm -hmm. That's V. And basically, inputs of V are measured, um, well, what's understood to be the value of V is the value of the goods that are necessary to reproduce uh, the worker's uh, capacity to work a given number of hours, right? So the amount of, say, part of it is going to be physical needs, Right, so the amount of food that you need to consume, and there may be the other needs um, that figure into the average wage, right? And that's going to be the value of the, that's going to determine the value of the labor power of the worker, right? And so V represents the quantity of the labor power of the work, uh, the workers employed in production of a given good. Now, uh, the third input is surplus value. Surplus value is a differential between the total amount of value produced by the worker uh, within, let's say, a work day. Um, and the value of the worker's labor power. So if you take the total value the worker produces and you subtract from that the value of the worker's labor power, which is essentially the average wage, you get surplus value, right? Now, if you add that up, C plus V plus S, right? Um, you'll get the value of the commodity. That's the formula for value, right? Gotcha. Okay. 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 So we've got to value. All right. Can I just, okay, just to make sure that I understand this. So we have, it was C plus V plus what equals the commodity? S, surplus value. Okay. So C was the, like, initial capital. Constant capital, yeah. Constant capital. They could also be broken down into the same formula. And then we have... V, which is the variable the, capital. Okay, that means, is that means labor, the, right? that's the value of labor power. Yep. 
Okay. And S, which is surplus value. Okay. Equals R. Good. Okay. Yeah. What is the... Okay, gotcha. All right. Okay. Now, now, how is it that from this we can develop a theory of the dynamics of capitalist production, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to understand that the that profit has its origin in surplus value. Right? So the idea is that C and V represent the initial capital outlay, out, sorry, outlay of the mm -hmm. capitalist, right? The capitalist is in the is engaged in production because he can make a profit, right? So if all he did was merely reproduce the counter value of his initial capital outlay, there'd be no incentive to risk his money in mm -hmm. production, right? So it's because the worker agrees to work eight hours, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say, but um, produces the value of his wage in just four hours of labor, right? that the capitalist is able to earn a profit on the theory, right? Because the capitalist, but what the worker has agreed to as part of the labor contract is he's just turning over his labor power to the capitalist for the eight hours, right? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't get to keep the goods that are produced at the end, right? Isn't he adding he's, his labor value to that constant capital, though? Why, should, why is he entitled to the surplus labor if he's, not, if he's only adding to somebody else's constant capital? I'm not sure what you mean by entitled. I, I'm just saying that that's the nature what do you, of What do you think I meant contract. when I asked that? Sure. What do you think I meant when I asked that? Can you? Well, I don't know whether you were referring to some moral, some kind of moral notion or some kind of legal notion, right? The le legally, I'm not making any moral claims at all, right? And the theory doesn't make any moral claims. It's not a normative theory. Yeah, I understand. Theory. I guess you made it sound like you, you work eight hours to produce like a given four hours of surplus labor or whatever. That's right. The, you, you, you engage in four hours of surplus labor and therefore um, would produce on that basis four hours worth of surplus value, right? Um, okay. So if the value of the commodity, the finished good, is mm -hmm. C plus V plus S, right? Mm -hmm. If that sells at its value, which is to say if the value is realized, right, that means that the capitalist, uh, upon sale, receives uh, a remuneration which is equivalent to the counter value of his initial capital outlay. So it covers the cost of his initial outlay, right? And then there's this amount that's left over that he gets to pocket. Now, he may have to pay out certain expenses out of that, right? They're going to mm -hmm. be things like... Um, taxes, uh, interest to lenders. They're going to be rents that he might pay to the landlord who leases him the land that his factory is on, let's say. Um, and there might be other costs that are not actually costs that contribute um, to the uh, qualities of the finished good. Things like advertising, insurance, um, uh, yeah, we, I got it. Lots of other and so stuff. on. But whatever's left over after all those payments is going to be profit. What Marx calls profit of enterprise, right? So that's on the theory. That's the reason why the capitalist um, is willing to risk his money, because he, because since the worker agrees to a contract, which um, whereby the worker will produce more value than the value of his wage, the capitalist is able to, to earn a profit, right? Now, how, is it, how does this basic um, understanding of commodities allow us to develop a theory of the dynamics of capitalist production? Well, here's um, a basic understanding. Here's an outline of uh, the basic mechanism or at least one of the basic mechanisms that will drive that, right? So given that capitalists are engaged in competition, right, um, 
for market share, there's going to be an incentive for capitalists to cut their costs um, in relation to their rise. I think I cut off for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's going to be an um, incentive for capitalists to cut their costs vis-a-vis um, -vis their rivals in production, right? Because then they can, they could, for instance, win a price war with their competitors and capture a larger market share. And they'll also earn a higher rate of profit if they do so, right? Uh, if they cut, if they succeed in cutting costs, right? And one way they can do that is by adopting labor-saving technologies. So, if you adopt a labor-saving technology, wait, hold on, just so I understand, is that's not the only way to do it, right? That's just one way to do it, or? Yeah, there might be other ways, right? Okay. But there's yeah, going to be a persistent drive. The idea is that there's going to be a persistent drive uh, for capitalists to find ways to cut costs by, mm -hmm. by adopting labor-saving technologies. Um, so let's look at how this affects the formula for value so we can understand how it generates a kind of dynamic and the uh, development of the mode of production, right? Um, so let's say, um, let's imagine a hypothetical good. Let's say, uh, I don't know, um, let's say uh, some kind of fancy bicycle um, that costs, let's say the, the value of the bicycle is, a, I don't know, let's say it's, Let's say that the, the typical, uh, let's say that the, the, um, the value of um, constant capital across uh, that sector of production in uh, a given production cycle is going to be something like, I don't know, let's say $1,000, right? And let's say that the, in that same production cycle, um, $1,000 worth of um, variable capital is employed. So the cost of labor, the average cost of labor in that sector of production in that production cycle will be $1,000. Um, and let's say that the rate of surplus value is 100%, right? So that means for every dollar that um, is employed in hiring workers, um, an additional dollar will be generated in production of surplus value, right? And so that means, so if the rate of surplus value is 100%, that means that if the variable capital is $1,000, rate of surplus value will be $1,000. Now, um, that means that the formula C plus V plus S will be 1,000 plus 1,000 plus 1,000. So the, the quantity of value of the finished product um, with that initial outlay will be $3,000, right? Now, the rate of profit, the formula for the rate of profit is S over C plus V. So a rate of profit is going to be 1,000 over um, 2,000. So you're going to get, have a very high rate of profit of 50% on your total capital out, outlay. Right. Um, now, let's imagine that a capitalist decides to adopt a labor-saving technology in order to cut his production costs. Mm -hmm. So let's say he employs an additional $200 worth of constant capital mm -hmm. um, relative to his competitors, right? Let's imagine he's the only person. Let's, you know, let's imagine he's the first person to do this. So 
nobody else in that sector of production has adopted this sure, new technology. Just, uh, fast forward a little bit. So the idea is that he's going to employ some cost saving capital. He's going to add to his cost right. capital, right? And then other people are going to be driven to compete. They're going to add their own cost saving capital. And given that we use this formula to predict the future value, we expect to see that the compensation for the labor is going to decrease as that second variable gets smaller and smaller as time goes on, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So wouldn't this only hold true for one given commodity? Couldn't we envision that additionally, like newly created goods and services happen over time, and then you start that formula over and over again? Is there any reason to think that we wouldn't be creating new goods and services constantly in the future? Well, theory isn't. It's not no part of the theory to. Um, the theory doesn't like predict that there can't be new goods and services, right? What okay, it's so saying just, is, is that this dynamic is going to be found in every sector of production. Yeah, I understand, I understand that. But so it so my initial question that I think we're on our way to is what does the LVD LVT predict? What is a good prediction from this that this model helps us for? And I think that right now we're on our way to explaining how um, owners, capitalists will constantly minimize the the costs of labor. They will decrease that second variable and over time we would expect to see workers exploitation increase. But my question is, is doesn't this, it seems like a central part of this and explaining how this LVT formula works here is this, this formula is relative to a particular commodity that as a new commodity is created, a lot of these numbers are probably going to reset. So if we employ some cost saving capital initially, that cost saving capital, that first variable is not going to necessarily hold true for the next commodity that's created. We might need a whole new form of capital investment at that point. And then if we do, if we can break that cycle, and now you can agree or disagree that that's possible, I, I would argue that we can, that new capital will be required for new jobs in the future. If that's the case, then can't we argue that we're always gonna be in this constant back and forth and you won't see this rate of, of wage compensation falling into the future because we can constantly create new goods and services? Um, I'm not really seeing how creating new goods and services is supposed to alter the fact that there's going to be a tendency for the rate of profit to decline. Sure, but my, uh, my argument is that the, the tendency of the rate of profit to decline is only bad if we think that this is like approaching zero, or if we think it's going to decrease continuously over time and get smaller and smaller and smaller. My contention is that if we create a new good or service, if we create a new commodity, every time we do it, that rate of profit is going to rise initially and then fall again. So rather than the, the rate of profit falling over long, long, long periods of times, it will fall and rise and fall and rise and fall and rise as new commodities are created. Well, I wasn't saying anything about the rate of the decline in the rate of profit as being something bad, right? What I was trying to do, you no, were asking it's me. bad. I'm saying that we're, it sounds like that as that happens over time, we're going to say that workers are continuously exploited. And what I'm saying is that if a new commodity is created, then that exploitation counter is going to kind of like reset that all the variables, that constant capital and all that is going to reset because now we have a new commodity that we're working with. You mean that if another commodity becomes obsolete, is that yeah. the idea? Yeah. Well, that might, I'm not. The theory isn't saying that there aren't going to be commodities that become obsolete, right? But if it's we're constantly just, creating new commodities, doesn't that mean then that we're not worried about a future potential where workers are increasingly exploited? That it might just be the case that as new commodities are created, the level of exploitation remains roughly the same over time? Well, again, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to raise any kind of worry, right? I was merely trying to I'm not talking about, okay, I'm not trying to ascribe any moral claims. I'm not trying to make it this normative, as you said. I'm not trying to do that, okay? I asked you in the, initially, what is a prediction that the labor theory of value makes that is like something novel or something that I couldn't understand under my current way of understanding economics? And now you're talking to me about all the factors that go into the LBT formula, and you're saying, well, one prediction. Now, if I'm misquoting you, feel free to correct me, okay? But what you said earlier, or what I heard earlier, was one prediction is that as time goes on, the labor is going to be increasingly exploited, that that exploitation is going to increase. And the way that you're beginning to demonstrate this to me is the addition of more and more constant capital, that first variable, is going to cause a decrease in that second variable. 
And what I'm challenging that with is I'm saying that that constant capital increase may decrease variable two, but that only holds true for one given commodity. That as commodities become obsolete and new commodities form and new constant capital is required, the compensation to that second variable is maybe remains roughly constant over time. It doesn't decrease as time goes on. Um, I'm still, I'm not, I'm not understanding how you're generating the prediction that we should expect to see the um, what's called the average comp well, it's called the composition of capital, right? To remain the same or something like that, um, so economy like wide. Okay, so let's okay, so let's just let's use a real world example, okay? And I'll see if I can understand all of our factors of production here, or whatever, and see if I understand this, okay? So let's say that we have a huge warehouse where we store documents, okay? So we have, in this warehouse, we have um, giant filing cabinets, okay? I'm going to call that C. And then we also have workers that we bring in that we have to pay a wage, and they go through the filing cabinets. We'll call that V. Um, and then you, like, let's say that the, the W, the, the thing, the product, the commodity you're selling at the end is, like, access to these documents to some company, and you yeah, charge that, them money. That's not... See, the access to documents is not going to be understood to be something that has a value. On the Wait, what do you mean? There, can I not analyze services using the LVT? Most services, probably not. 80% of our economy is a service economy. I can't understand any services using the labor theory of value? I didn't say any, right? I specifically said most, probably not, right? Well, so, most yeah, most services are not actually going to be understood to be value producing on labor theory of value. Okay. Okay. Let's use a different example. Okay. Let's say that we're making cars. Okay. So I've got my constant capital is going to be my tools. Um, we've got the, um, our V variable is going to be the workers that we pay to work on things. Um, S is going to be the surplus value that's created um, when V acts on C, I think, right? And then W is our car sold at the end, right? Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> it seems like what our worry is, is that over time, as capitalists seek to minimize V, they're going to add more to C, and they're going to minimize V, and that's a trend that we would expect to see over time. That as the capitalist adds more and more tools to their arsenal of car making stuff, that wage labor is going to be compensated less and less, and we would tend to see that fall over time. Is that, is that an okay understanding of what we're saying? Well... What I'm saying is, is that what, what the theory predicts is that, um, that of the total value product, right, the amount of it, which is surplus value, mm -hmm. is going to increase over time proportional mm -hmm. to the amount of it, which is um, workers' wages. So Yeah, so for instance, so if we added more tools... Um, if we added more to our constant capital, the surplus value would remain the same, but the wage compensation would decrease. We would expect to say that over time, right? Well, given that the, that the technologies being adopted are labor-saving, right, you're going to be... That's, we're going to assume that's what the constant capital added would be is labor-saving. It's not just for kicks, right? Yeah, we'll, because it's, because it's labor-saving, mm -hmm. um, there's... The, I guess the way to th one way to think about it is that the the av the weighting of um, constant capital to variable capital is going to increase on the, ratio the side. Ratio would of increase, yes, yeah, on the yeah. side of the constant capital, yes. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay, that's what we would expect to see over time. So what I'm saying is that. That particular formula, okay, that's relative to a single commodity. Do you understand that? Yeah, but the point is, is that the same, yeah, there are going to be different formulas in different yes. industries. Okay. So what I'm some... saying is that if we expect to see the ratio of C to V increase over time, that's going to be with respect to a given commodity, it, to that one formula. However, let's say in the future we go from making cars to um, flying vehicles, we're going to get a whole new formula 
where the ratio of C to V might reset completely. And that those might be further replaced by some other commodity where the ratio of C to V resets completely. So what I'm saying is that it seems like we would only expect to see that ratio of C to V. We would only expect to see that increase indefinitely over and over and over again. And we'd only we'd expect to see that to increase to hugely large numbers only within a single given commodity. But if we're constantly creating new commodities, I don't know if we would expect to see that tendency over time. Oh. What I'm trying to understand is, is why would you think that the replacement rate of um, new commodities for old commodities would be like highly labor intensive? Why, why would you think that the majority of those because new the product commodities of, would be highly labor intensive? the product highly of capital. Because it seems like the productivity of labor has grown tremendously as time has gone on. How does that generate that prediction? How does what I'll, I'll that? grant you I'll grant you that the theory does predict that there will be increasing productivity of labor, right? That is a prediction of the theory, right? So I'm granting to you that we should expect to see um, increase in labor productivity, right? What I'm trying to understand is, is how an increase in labor productivity generates a predictive expectation that as new commodities um, are created, um, that the, those industries that develop in order to produce those commodities will, um, on balance, be highly labor intensive rather than highly capital intensive. I don't understand that. I don't know if they'd be highly labor intensive, but I think that it's possible that the intensity of the labor might hold somewhat constant with the relationship to capital. That's a possibility. I'm not saying that's definitely going to happen. I'm saying we have to acknowledge that that is possible. Um, I mean, I'm not really sure what, why it would be important what, what, what would turn on conceding that it's possible, right? Well, because unless if you I were think, to concede that, then we would get rid I, of the entire prediction of the LVT to say that like compensation to workers is going to fall indefinitely in the future. Saying that something is possible, right, is not any kind of concession, right? What would be a concession would be that it was likely, because then what's expected on the theory, that then it would just not be the case that What's said to be expected on the theory is, in fact, expected on the theory. So at what point then, if, if for our highly predictive model, I guess, at what point then do we expect to see the compensation of wages to workers fall to approaching zero or uh, some unsustainable level? I don't, I don't have a prediction of that kind. Right? So what are well, we predicting again with the LVT? We're saying that one of the predictions of the theory is is that as a secular tendency, we should see a declining share of the total value product accruing to workers relative to the share accruing to capital. And why, can you explain why I can't understand this in like conventional economic terms? Why do I need the LVT to understand this? So, the, what I think is the case is that that's what's called a novel prediction of the theory. Um, are you familiar with the idea of predictive novelty? In predicting something or... new that hasn't been predicted before or something unique? Yeah, to see, the theory. reason why predictive novelty is significant is that it's sort of taken to be a high, highly, well, what's called a highly virtuous explanatorily with respect to a theory. So in other words, the idea is, is that if you have a theory that correctly predicts novel facts, that's like taken to be extremely strong corroboration of the theory. It's well, not if, merely if that the novel it predicts, things actually happen though, right? That's right. That's right. So if you can design a theory to predict something that you know about, right? And if it so you might have some observed phenomenon and you uh, can design a theory to explain that, right? But 
although you can say that your theory is corroborated on that basis, it's kind of like a weak confirmation of the theory relative to um, a theory that not only predicts what's observed, but predicts things that are unexpected, right? Because if you correctly predict several things that are unexpected, mm -hmm. of that's course. taken is to there be an example? Like strong corroboration. Sure. Is there an example of a novel prediction the labor theory of value made that ended up being correct that nobody else was able to understand economically? Well, it depends on what you mean by nobody else is able to understand economically. So more like neoclassical or more conventional like economic theory. Yeah. That... So the thing is, here's here's the basic case, right? Like mm -hmm. an outline. <clears throat> the the basic case for the theory is that the theory. Uh, generates, let's say, 11, maybe 12 basic predictions, which are kind of like long-term trends, primarily uh, in the evolution of capitalist societies, right? Now, there, there may be other ways you can independently confirm the theory, right? But one of the main ways, or maybe the main way you can confirm the theory is by looking at the, um, the, these main 11 or 12 so-called laws of motion of the capitalist mode of production that um, are predictions of the theory, right? Now, so the claim is that all or nearly all of those predictions are actually novel predictions. Okay, so all of okay. them have it come like true. We've taken, yeah. We, we, yeah. So okay. So let me try to recenter this. Okay. So what I'm asking very simply is: Is there a novel prediction the LVT made that came true? It wasn't predicted by any other model. Not are there tons of new predictions that haven't come true well, yet? That's what is I was it? trying to get. No, I think they've all. Well, I think all the main ones have come true. Okay, can you just right. talk to me about one? Just one that nobody yeah, else declining. predicted. declining. Yeah, decline. Well, when you say nobody else, so this is the point, right? The point is you can construct a model after a trend has been observed. You can But then it wouldn't be novel. You, we that's both right. know. Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. not what I'm yeah. saying. So, we so both what know I'm that's saying, what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Okay, so what it, I'm it saying has to be is, something besides the tendency of the rate of profits fall because it's still contested. People don't even agree on that one yet. Are there any other like predictions, any other novel predictions that the LVT made that no other prior constructed model, not one that was constructed. Yeah, so there's there's yet. about 11 or 12. Can you give me one of them? Yeah, I gave you one. I said that there's a declining share of value of the total value product accruing. Can you give me a, can you give me a second one? Yeah, there one? should be increasing centralization of capital. Sorry, let me give you a different one. Increasing oh, well, concentration... Wait. Increasing it, it, concentration of capital. How, how would no... Aren't, aren't these well understood under most like economic models? So we have like terms so, like an economy of scale. We've got like more efficient production by larger firms. Like wouldn't this be understood traditionally? Yeah. So I mean, you can have a debate about whether in 1867, right? Uh -huh. These were all novel predictions, right? Some economists are going to claim that they are, right? You could have a debate about that, right? I don't think a lot is going to turn on that question, right? Because I don't think within um, what might be called subjective value theory, mainstream economics, there are models that exist that explain the ensemble of predictions predicted by the labor theory of value, right? So there's plenty of post hoc models that can explain each of those predictions, well, at least maybe not all of them, but several of those predictions singly, right? So the reason why the labor theory of value um, can be understood to be um, to have to be abductively highly virtuous, right, um, is a because it. Um, makes several correct predictions, right, which is going to be like 
roughly a dozen maybe uh, of a specific type, right? These long-term trend type predictions. The vast majority of those are going Your thing cut off. Sorry. Yeah. The, the, the vast majority of those are going to be novel predictions, and the whole set is explained by a single model, right? Now, I don't think that there is, in subjective value theory, any theory that has explanatory power of the same scope, right, or that is predictively, no predictively novel, right, on the same scale as the labor theory of value, right, which is the reason why I think that the labor theory of value is, <clears throat> you know, one of the most robust theories in terms of empirical soundness in the social sciences. That's my claim. Why, why don't any contemporary economists use the labor theory of value to understand anything real, like contemporaneously about economics? Well, I can just offer you a speculation about that, right? Because I don't actually think that um, it would be something that would be acceptable to the people who endow academic institutions if the economic theory that was taught in those institutions was that the source of all profit lies in exploitation, right? I don't think that's actually acceptable. I don't just call, you said it's not a normative theory, so couldn't instead of exploitation, couldn't we just give it another word? So you're saying that all of academia, all economists are all kind of like lying to themselves, knowing that there's a superior theory out there, but none of them will engage with it. because I, I didn't say they were lying to themselves, right? I'm just saying that, that there's a kind of, my speculation is that there's a kind of filter built into um, the academy whereby academic ideas that actually are in some way um, challenging to the prerogatives of the people who endow um, academic institutions are going to be disincentivized. The, the people who do, who do endow those institutions are going to be disincentivized to endow institutions or departments or chairs or whatever wouldn't it be right. the case that if like one university like wanted to make a name for itself and it started employing like a whole bunch of Marxist econ professors that started making all of these accurate predictions about the economy, wouldn't we expect to see this type of thought enter the mainstream incredibly quickly? They, like this one university would come out and it's like, boom, 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 boom. Look at all these accurate predictions you made. Like this is such, wouldn't we expect to see more people adopt that type of thought? I don't have that expectation. I think that things that actually th threaten ruling class prerogatives right are not actually going to are not actually going to flourish or attract money so we think right? the so the ruling class controls the academic institutions or at least exercise well, the influence ones who, over them i to, think they're the ones who endow universities right and they do rule. this on like a worldwide level because it seems like the marxist stuff isn't very popular it in doesn't opinion. yeah well capitalism is the reigning uh, mode of production in almost every country in the world, right? There's like maybe two, maybe three countries where it no longer is the reigning model. It, sorry, no longer is the reigning mode of production. So in those, in those countries, I think we would expect to see that Marxist economics would um, be taken more seriously. Um, okay. Um, well, is there anything else you want to go over? No, I just wanted to get clarity on this point, right? Because I, people, look, people have been contacted. I've actually spoken to you before. You, I'm sure you don't remember that probably like a couple of years ago in your server, um, I was invited in a couple of times because you were talking about the labor theory of value. And I was asked by, I think, some Marxist people who were, in, you know, in your voice channel to come in because I'm, I have, I'm somewhat known, um, you know, on the internet as a defender of the labor theory of value. I've had, you know, at least like one or two prominent debates that, you know, like in the Marxist part of, um, 
the internet uh, were like, you know, well known, right? And so I actually came in to sort of correct a few points and you were very gracious about it and said, yeah, well, I, I guess I misunderstood. Thank you for correcting me, something like that, right? And that was sort of the end of that. But shortly afterwards, uh, or at least, you know, several months later or something, people started to say you were attacking the labor theory of value. And they asked me if I would have a conversation with you about it to address that, right? Now, I, you know, said, well, I would look into it. But for whatever reason, a long time has passed since those people started contacting me. And the issue came up again because of your discussions with Pogan and Richard Wolf, right? And I understood you to be saying that the theory is bullshit, right? And I, I, I will I say that actually... like after this conversation, my opinion is wholly unchanged. But... Okay, well, so do you think you can make an argument that the theory is bullshit? Because... Because if not, I, I, is gonna, I mean, like, I, so I feel like our first problem is the idea that we can't explain a, like 80% of the economy because we have no way to analyze services. When I think we can do that, like it, with a marginalist framework, it seems a little sus to me. Or uh, does that, do you not care about that? Or I'm curious, how, how does that, how do you square that away in your head that you have no. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> so the labor theory of value is the view, is part of the view that the source of all value lies in the productive sectors. And so the profits that are accrued in services are actually sucked out, um, so to speak, of the productive sectors of the economy. Can, right. So let's so, say that, so let's see, I know, I know we get really uncomfortable when I ask LVTRs to do this, but like, let's try to use a real world example. Let's say that we set up a massage parlor outside we have people lay on the ground and we just give them back rubs how does that service take money out of like the productive or the the manufacturing or whatever other sectors can you explain that well i'm just saying that on the theory it doesn't actually generate value right you're paid for the service right and if your costs uh are lower than what you're paid right you can earn a profit in that sector i'm just saying that from a theoretical point of view right, from the point of view of this theory, the LTV, there's no actual value being generated in that product, in, in, in that sector. What's happening is that value is flowing into the sector in the form of payments, right? And those payments happen to be greater than the costs that it takes to undertake those services. And so therefore those people can earn a profit. But it's not in any way, I, I just, I don't see why that's some kind of problem for the theory, right? Because it seems it to me that this theory, the theory is like, it exists way. like very much on like the very fringe margins in terms of making some very grand predictions about the economy in the future. But in terms of like day-to-day -day understanding of like economics, it just has zero, it seems like it offers almost no utility. Okay, so what, what I wanted to understand was, see, I'm still, I'm still not clear on what your position is, right? Your thing just cut off again. Sorry. I'm still trying to understand what your position is, right? Because what I, I was trying to, that's why I kept asking you, are, your, are you claiming that the theory is inconsistent, A? Are you claiming that it's false, B? Are you claiming that it's circular, C? Are you claiming that it's unfalsifiable, D? Are you claiming that it's ad hoc, E? Right. Are you claiming okay. that? Okay. What... Okay. So just to be clear, you just said the same thing like five times. All I'm saying is that I don't think there's much utility out of it. That's all I'm saying. That's that, I'll say that again. I think I've said that before. It might be wholly consistent. We could generate any theory we want out of a set of axioms, and it could be consistent and wholly whatever. But my, my problem is that I just don't think it offers much utility. I don't think it like maps onto reality much. I don't see much predictive power in it other than these like 11 or 12 novel things that it seems like you said other economic models already can predict and explain. And then also the fact that it doesn't seem to account for, or at least the value has no mapping on a price where like 80% of our economy seems to be pretty troublesome as well. Yeah, well, so again, I, I, see, that's why I was, I was see, you, you raised a number of points there, so I'd have to address each of those in turn, right? So you said that it was troublesome that it doesn't provide a, um, it's not a theory of the service sector. 
And see, I, I'm trying to understand why that's a problem for the theory, right? The existence of services doesn't – the fact that services could be the dominant part of the economy, none of that actually contradicts the theory. So I'm not understanding why that's a problem for the theory. It just it feels like I have no useful way by which to map that value that the LTV produces at- – to onto anything that exists in the service sector. So why would I ever use this form of analysis or why would I care about any predictions that it well, makes? I, I, You're then cut off again. Sorry. The reason why the form of analysis was taken to be value is, sorry, taken to be valuable is that it describes the evolution of the capitalist economy, right? And it's highly corroborated. Okay, right. real quickly, hold on, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, because you keep repeating this. I don't care that it can explain something. I'm asking for novel, because exp- we've got competing theories that explain things, right? So my question is, why would I use, because you're the one making the affirmative argument for the, the LVT, right? So, I'm, so I'm, I'm just asking why, why this over something else that seems to be more widely accepted, like ubiquitously around the world? Yeah, because those theories don't actually are not as highly corroborated as the labor theory of value, right? And because they're not as highly corroborated, they're therefore less valuable in terms of understanding the future dynamics of capitalist system, right? If we want to understand how the capitalist system is going to evolve, right? If that's what we're interested in, right? Because you, you do understand, right? I know, see, I wasn't, I'm not really interested in debating socialism, um, but you understand, right, that for orthodox Marxists, right, part of the rationale for socialism is because it's understood that on the labor theory of value, right, capitalism is not taken to be something, at least by some Marxists, to be something that can survive in the future, right? It's understood to be a contradictory mode of production and therefore to not be sustainable. Right? Does it seem weird that it's supposed to explain like so much of capitalism, yet it seems inadequate to account for like 80% of the economy or like every economic sector trying to transform into service economies? I'm not sure what you mean by, <clears throat> by inadequate, right? What do, you, what do you think I mean by inadequate? Sorry, the theory doesn't purport to be a theory of the service sector, right? It's a theory of the productive sectors of the economy, right? But it understands that all value in the economy has its origin in the productive sectors and is therefore the source of the profits that are accrued in the service sector, right? right so you're telling me the labor theory of value is, is, isn't convinced with services or, or doesn't concern itself with services? Well, it doesn't offer a theory right, of some kind of, like, equilibrium price for services, or at least for most services. There are some services which are taken productive, but... Okay, so if you're giving me, like, a theory of value that only accounts for physical... Then it's only physical goods, or...? Yeah. My view is that labor theory of value is a theory of material goods. Well, so how do you do, how do you deal with what do you do when you've got like physical goods that have some service involved in them like like there we can i can posit several real world examples or, or hypotheticals where service is part of like and services service services have labor as an input shouldn't we theoretically be able to generate a value with them using your socially necessary labor shouldn't we be able to theoretically value those services using the lvt there are some services that are taken to be productive, right? And for those, yes, right? But um, there are going to be other services that are going to be taken to be unproductive, and those services are not going to be under- Can you, What is the difference between a productive and an unproductive service? The basic idea is that the service um, contributes to... Uh, a material change in the commodity. This doesn't sound like a service to me. This just sounds like labor. 
What's the difference, labor that, sir, what's the difference between service that contributes to uh, uh, a good or that, cha that changes something materially and labor? What's the difference between that service and labor? So there's a, there are services. I, I take it that you think a bookkeeper is laboring, right? Um, what do you mean by bookkeeper? Like a librarian? No, an accountant. Somebody oh, who oh. like... An accountant is laboring. Yes. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Yeah. Right. But my point is, is that the labor of the accountant doesn't actually, um, affect, uh, doesn't actually alter the material quality. Yeah. But what I'm material. asking you is what is a service that affects the material quality of something that isn't just labor? It is labor. Okay. So then there are no services that are accounted for. It's all labor, right? No, I'm saying that there are some services which are productive and some which not, are unproductive. Yeah, but I'm trying to ask, what is an example of a productive service that isn't just labor? Oh, like polishing. What, what, what do you mean that isn't just labor? It is labor. All, all services. Yeah, so then there are, are no productive. services. It's all labor. That's just labor. I don't know why you call it a productive service. I don't understand service. why. Why would you have two different names for the same thing? So we distinguish, um, we, we can say that um, a service is performed upon the good, right? That's not the same thing as the good, right? So if but, I'm wait, 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 no, 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 no. That is though, right? If we take our other formula, right? All labor is just acting on some capital, right? Which could be a good, arguably. Is it not? Yeah, well, so some things that we call services, for instance, are transportation, right? That's generally classified as a service. Right. So if is I got a productive good or is that I'm sorry, is that a productive yeah. service? That's a productive service. Yeah. How if you transport a good from Antarctica, uh -huh. right, where there where nobody actually um, lives to a place where people live so they can buy it. You've materially altered the good. From the so I'm asking material. what is the difference between that productive service and labor? Like if we were to plug that into our formula from earlier, isn't that just aren't we just talking about labor? So all productive services are labor. There are going to be some labors, though, which are not productive. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is we have these inputs of labor into productive services, but we also have inputs of labor into non-productive services. How is it that we're adding inputs of labor into non-productive services? How do those non-productive services not have a final value that we can account for? Because on the theory, right, uh -huh. value is understood to be a function of there being some material change in the good brought about by the labor. How do you, and how do you measure that material change, I guess, then? I'm not sure what you mean by how do you measure it, right? You have a finished good, and if that labor contributes to the, um, to it being that good rather than some other good, which is mm -hmm. generated by the production process, right? Then that's going to be taken to be one of the value producing labors, right? That figures into the quantity of socially necessary labor time that's taken to constitute the value of the good. Okay. So, Okay, and that's all that's figured out by just dividing the, t the total amount of hours spent on the total number of goods or whatever, and then you get the number of socially necessary hours to, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Um, anything else you want to chat about? Well, so I just, I just want to get clarity on these points, right? So, because I want, I want to have this on record as to what it is that you're actually claiming that I haven't addressed, right? Because, see, like, I wouldn't expect a person to be convinced of the labor theory of value on the basis of anything that I've said, right? Because what I've said is, is that the theory um, is corroborated by empirical data, right? And I haven't given you any empirical data, right? So without you give me, sure. That, do you want to give me a little bit of uh, one or two empirical datums? Well, I mean, I can link you to some some papers or books or whatever. Is it all going to be on the tendency of profit to fall, or is it going to be on other types of empirical claims? I can I can give you stuff on on all the predictions if you're interested, right? 
But the point that I'm getting at is that I wouldn't expect anybody to come out of this conversation and say, yeah, I'm convinced that labor theory of value is true, right? I wasn't mm-hmm. trying to convince you the labor theory of value is true, right? I merely was interested in contesting claims that labor theory of value is incoherent or false or vacuous or circular or unfalsifiable or ad hoc or um, surpassed empirically by rival theories or anything like that, right? And I just, I'm not clear which of which of any of those claims you're making or what other claims you might be making. Sure. So to recenter again, my, my only initial claim was that I just don't see any novel predictions made by the legacy, the, by the labor theory value that aren't accounted for by other more mainstream economic theories that have greater predictive power. So is there, so if I gave you a list of the predictions generated by the theory, you could tell me a mainstream theory or model that predicts all those things? Uh, I'd probably have to go ask an economist, but I reject the idea that there are all of these huge problems that are unsolved that the, the, the legacy theory of value purports to answer, but every academic and every university are all have this big filter and refuse to analyze it through a Marxist lens. I don't, I, I think that's an absurd notion. Um, but I mean, if you want to give me some, if you want to give me some of what you consider to be novel predictions made by the like the labor theory of value, I mean, I can go and ask some more educated economics friends or do some reading into them, and then I can come back and try to give you, well, this is how it's accounted for under a marginalist framework. And I don't need uh, labor theory of value to explain it. If you want, we could do that, but I'm probably not going to be able to explain all of the intricacies of the economy in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to understand is, I'm just what I'm trying to understand is what it is exactly. You're you're saying that. When you say you reject it, you reject what I'm saying, right? <clears throat> Are you rejecting? What is the basis upon which you're rejecting it? I'm trying to understand. I'm rejecting the idea that there is an international conglomerate of academics that all have a filter that are disincentivized from using the labor of theory value to ec- analyze economics despite its superior predictive powers just because they're pressured or bullied by capitalists not to do so. That's I didn't I'm say saying. that they were pressured or bullied, right? What did I'm you say exactly? What I'm saying is, is that people who actually do defend the labor theory of value, right, are less likely to track the money um, that people who endow ex- about endow academic institutions are likely to um, to give to those institutions, right? They're just not yeah, and I, I understand what you're saying. I, I don't. I just don't agree with that. I don't. I don't. I don't think that would be the case. I feel like if there was an economic theory out there that was making novel predictions, that was right. highly but predictive, what I'm saying that is it would you gather. You don't paper. actually have. What I'm saying is you don't have any specific evidence, right, that the labor theory of value, that any of the predictions it makes are false, that it's actually incoherent. I mean, for, okay, so to be clear, yeah, sure, things, okay, right? real quick, so you're repeating a lot of things that I've said I haven't said. I've said specifically multiple times, I've never said that it's incoherent, and I've never said that it is, um, like, it, it is inconsistent or anything like that. You keep saying that, okay? I believe it might be fully coherent and fully consistent. I've said that multiple times now. What I'm saying is that I don't think that it has any utility as an economic theory. It doesn't seem to make novel predictions that other theories don't account for. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but I'm asking you for evidence. That. I can't prove a negative. What do you mean? I can make up anything right now. And you t- especially... you're, saying, you're saying you don't think, right, that it makes novel predictions that other economic theories um, also make, right? I, you're sure. saying that there are other, so, you're all, so... for every prediction, mm-hmm. you're saying for every prediction, right, um, mm-hmm. that the labor theory of value makes, there's some mainstream economic theory mm-hmm. that predicts that same thing. Right, that's what you're claiming, right? Yeah, that's it. Seems to be the case. Yeah. yeah. And now, is that why are you claiming that? Because I've never, in all of my life of studying policy or any econ arguments or debates about anything related to anything economics related, have I ever had like an inadequate tool to understand something? And then it's like, oh well, hold on. What if we use the labor uh, theory of value? Now we can understand it. Now we've got like yeah, a better. Why, why would you think that those theories are concerned? with trying to explain the kinds of things that the labor theory of value is trying to explain. In that case, I don't know what it tries to explain, and I just don't really care then. <laughs> I don't, I don't. 
Yeah, okay, yeah. look, I don't have mm-hmm. a problem with you saying that you don't care about what the labor theory of value explains, right? I'm, I'm merely concerned with somebody who says the theory is bullshit, the theory is false, right? You understand, right, that there's a good reason to care about it, right? If the theory is true, right, and I'm correct that what the theory does predict is that capitalism is unsustainable in the future, right? That actually has political implications, right? Many people are going to draw the conclusion that we should try to replace capitalism, perhaps with socialism, right? Now, you might not care about that, but my understanding was that you do actually debate that issue a fair amount, right? Which is why people were interested in me addressing, right, your claims that the theory is bullshit or whatever it is that you said about the theory, you know, because I haven't actually listened to any of the streams, right? Sure, so I'll repeat it for like the 20. Can you, can you, uh, I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, I'm like, if you want, you can shoot me over some like novel predictions of the labor theory value that you think is like, oh, like you can't understand this, you know, under normal econ models and I'll look them up. And if you know, if it's not like, oh, wow, like, you know, the labor theory of value here makes actually a pretty good prediction. And I can understand this uh, in a marginalist framework at all. Then, yeah, then I'll be like, okay, sure. This is better, but. Okay, so the fact is, is that all you're really saying is, is you, don't, you don't actually care about what the theory claims to predict or explain, right? I, I, I literally haven't said that multiple right? times. I've literally told you multiple times that I am interested in the predictions, and if it makes novel predictions that can't be accounted for with other models, I'd be interested in seeing that. Do okay, I need to repeat so that again? What exactly is the claim that you're making about the theory? Merely that you're unconvinced? That I thus have far, a with that. that thus far, I have not heard of any novel predictions that the labor theory of value makes that ha- can't be explained by a current economic thought. Okay, and that's it, right? The, you don't have any argument that the theory is bullshit. No, why would I waste my time trying to argue if a theory is... There's probably a billion different... There's probably theories of flat Earth out there and and a whole bunch of crazy stuff that may or may not be... I don't have time. I'm not going to run through and make claims. All I'm going to say is, oh, this theory seems to be worthless. Or I don't think that it makes any worthwhile predictions. I don't think it has any utility. Why would I Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh Mm -hmm. Saying that you think the theory is worthless is a positive claim, right? It would mean that there was some reason to think that whatever predictions the theory made right are actually false or something like that right that's not true that the theory... no no that's not true so at all. What, what is the reason to think it's worthless exactly because there's no utility that's why that's why we value everything right if we take an instrumentalist yeah. approach so to scientific thought, theory... hold on excuse me oh, hold on let me finish okay i think that you and i probably both take an instrumentalist approach to most scientific theories we can invent theories all day that have no utility they might be wholly consistent okay and they might make like even some predictions within their own models, and they might be internally consistent or whatever, that doesn't make them useful. That doesn't mean they have utility. So we can make a theory that is fully consistent, that has variables and everything and blah, 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 and has inputs and all that, but we can still say like, oh, there's no utility for this. It's worthless. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Sorry, I, I thought I addressed the point about utility, right? I thought that it would be useful to many people, probably most people, I'd wager, right? Whether capitalism has a tendency to break down, right? Something like that, right? Mm-hmm. But that hasn't been that's, demonstrated, so... I'm not saying that you... It's been demonstrated to you that that's the case, It doesn't right? seem You're, like it's been demonstrated to anyone. Your thing is cut out. You're, if you want to have a discussion as to the reasons why the theory predicts things like the instability of capital, its tendency to crisis... Right. That kind of thing. Right. That's what what we were doing when we were going over the um, the uh, theories understanding of mechanisms that involve technological change in production. Right. It's from those starting points. Right. You can you can draw inferences about things like the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Right. And how that contributes to economic crises and so on right so again we haven't gone through that right so i'm just not sure without having gone through it right you would offer some kind of opinion about whether um such a demonstration actually exists out there i i don't understand what your expectations are 
are you of the expectation that in order to say a particular theory has no utility, that you need to know every single criticism and every single claim and every single defense and refutation of said theory? Is that necessary? Do we go through life yeah. being agnostic towards every single theory that's ever been made? Or do you consider all of them equally viable until you've exhaustively debunked a particular theory? Well, when you say the theory has no utility, right? I'm trying to understand how you understand that claim, right? Because it seems to me there's two basic ways I can understand that claim, right? Which is, one, there isn't anything that the theory purports to tell us that would be of interest to anybody, right? Now, I address that point by talking about, for example, how the theory has implications with respect to politics because it suggests that capitalism has a tendency to break down, right? Now, you could say, well, that's not what I meant when I said the theory has no utility. It's not that what the theory purports, um, uh, it's not what, what's um, purported to be derived from the theory, if it were true, would be of no utility. Rather, it's just that there's no reason to think that that's true. Right. So when you say it has no utility, I'm trying to understand which of those two interpretations, or if it's some other, uh, you have something else in mind. What is it that you actually mean by that? Is it the first or the so second? I'm gonna, okay, so I'll explain one more time. I have never in my life needed the labor theory of value to understand anything in economics ever. And I have never in my life seen somebody propose to use the labor theory of value to explain anything in economics ever. So it doesn't seem to me that it has any utility. So I don't concern myself with it. I don't use it. And I question those that do. I haven't seen any novel predictions made by the labor theory of value that aren't explained by any economic models. So I don't know what utility somebody would gain by using such an outdated form of analysis. That's all I'm saying. Wait, why do you say that it's outdated? I don't get it. Because it's made predictions for hundreds of years that haven't come true, and because nobody in current which, economic which thought theory, which prediction, which prediction is derivable from the theory that it hasn't come true? The so my understanding is that Marx thought that the inherent contradictions in capital would lead to a collapse of capitalism in his lifetime, and it has been a but, long time. But since why that. would you think? Why would you think that that's derivable from the theory? I, that's my understanding is that's a big prediction that Marx makes. Are you saying that yeah. the inherent contradictions of, hold on, can you answer me this? Are you saying that the inherent contradictions of capitalism that are expressed through like the labor theory value, that that's not a claim that Marx would have made that capital Marx, Marx only... probably did. I think it is true that Marx believed, right. That capitalism would not have endured by, you know, 2021. Right. The question is, is that something that's licensed by the theory, right? And I don't see how the theory makes a prediction that by 2021, <clears throat> we should expect to see the breakdown of capitalism, right? So I don't see that any prediction by the theory is disconfirmed by the fact that capitalism- Okay, still and then what, what, were the, what, were the, what were the predictions that it confirms again? Yeah, so we can go through those. We can go through those, right? Okay. There are gonna be things okay. like, yeah. We, there are going to be things like um, the centralization and concentration of capital. That, I, don't, like, I don't think any marginalist would disagree that that's like a tendency that. Your mic is not responding if you're talking. Sorry, no, I wasn't talking. Oh, okay, gotcha. I didn't know. Yeah, so again, it's, it's not really relevant whether marginalists would agree or disagree whether those tendencies are observed, not, not right? only is it absolutely relevant it is literally paramount it is exactly what we're talking about because of every single claim you can make with the labor theory of value can be subsumed under some mainstream economic theory that isn't going to scratch its head and be unable to explain like non-productive services i'm going to go with the more explanatory theory yeah that but explains the point, more is, in the economy. Point, is, point is that's just a claim that you've made right Okay, I'm and I'm asking you, you right now to, to and I'm that. asking you to give me something novel that the L the, the labor theory of value explains that I can't understand. Yeah, so again, I can give you like these eleven predictions, right? Yeah, go okay, go for it. Go go ahead and give me a few. Yeah, so 
there's going to be things like the um, a declining share of the total value product should accrue to labor. These yep, we've capital. gone over that one. And then what's the next one? Capital has a tendency to centralize. We've gone over that one. What's the next one? Capital is, capital has a ten capital has a tendency to concentrate. Right. Yeah, we've gone over this. What's the There's next? There's a one? tendency of the rate of profit to fall during. That you just restated. Long ways. So what's the next one? Long ways periods of expansion. There's a tendency for um, uh, industries to become more capital intensive. I don't think oh. any marginalist would disagree with this either. Go ahead. Well, see. Again, I'm not really understanding what the relevance is of whether marginalists will agree or disagree, right? Because do you understand is, why, if I have competing economic theories, I would probably pick the one that can explain the service sector and not the one that just can't explain any of the service sector? Like, yeah, the theory doesn't purport to explain the service. Sector. Sure, but I've got some other that theories that explain the every theory. single thing the labor theory of value explains again, plus this more. Is just so, a claim, right? That's not, not a claim. claim. No, we're going we're claim. going through your claims right now. Okay, so then I okay, so here's a question I have for you. Okay, do you have any of these? Are any of these eleven predictions? Some I don't know what you mean by the word novel. Also, by the way, I don't. We must. I must just not know what you mean by that, or you're using it in a very unique way. I don't know what your theory. Like, what does it does it make any predictions that a marginalist wouldn't understand? I don't know what you mean by wouldn't understand. Why wouldn't they understand them? Because their form of analysis like doesn't provide an explanation look wait do you, you not wait you, do you not have anything after all you know, of I, this again so again so right i understand what your claim to be what you what the claim you're making is right is that you can find an economic model on uh, subjective value theory that explains all the things that the labor theory of value explains and more, right? That's your claim, right? Yeah. Great. Okay. So that's your challenge. I'm going to give you the list of predictions, right? And then you're going to find that theory that explains all those things, right? And it's a single model, right? The labor theory of value is a single model that explains all those 11 things, right? So you're going to find me an economic model that predicts all those same phenomena correctly, all 11 right? You're, that's your challenge, right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to ask an economist to do that, right? Okay, so, so, you're, so then what of these 11 things then could a subjective theory of value not explain? Yeah, so again, I'm telling you this, right? I've been telling you this multiple times, right? There is no such theory that does that. There are individual models that can explain each of those things, or maybe not okay, all of them. Okay, hold on, stop, stop. Singly. What I'm asking you is, is because that's essentially what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the labor theory of value versus subjective theory of value. And I'm asking you to tell me, can you tell me anything of your 11 predictions that I wouldn't be able to understand with the subjective theory of value? What I'm telling you is they can't be explained as an ensemble. That's the key point, right? You can develop a model that predicts things like um, uh, industries becoming more capital intensive. Right? You can develop a model on marginalist uh, assumptions that predicts that, right? The point is, there's no marginalist assumption that explains all the things predicted by the labor theory of value, right? Which is why the labor theory of value, right, mm -hmm. is So superior. you're just wrong. I think you're just wrong. Yeah. You <laughs> so it sounds to me then, so you can't so give me anything. Talk all about the theory, right, it's going to yeah, tell so me... It sounds 20 to me years studying this that I'm wrong about this, right? So that's fine. You can put your money where your mouth is. I'm going to give you the 11 predictions, right? And you're going to find me the economic model that predicts all those things. That's not the labor theory of value. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to say the subjective theory of value does. You can say it, right? You have to show uh -huh. right, how those predictions are derivable from the same model. Okay. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to link you to a document, uh -huh. right, that lists all the 11 predictions, right? And then you're going to go start emailing different subjective value theorists, right, and ask them which model predicts all these things. Okay. Right. 
That's your burden, right? Sure. Okay, that's it. Conversation over. Okay. Um, I guess we're good then. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to link that. I'm going to link that document in the chat, and uh -huh. I hope I'm not going to hear from people that you're saying that the theory is bullshit, right? Until you've met your burden. Okay. Okay, that's great. I look forward to seeing you fulfill your burden. Okay, me too. What? Oh, okay. I guess I'll talk to you later then, all right? Okay, I'll see you later. I'm going to post it in the chat. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hang up now, okay? Goodbye.